Hello, I'm Anthony. Uh, today we're going to have a look at the sampler control. The sampler control sits right next to the sample editor. And this is one of the confusing things about this control. It shares a lot of its terminology with another area of functionality in Cubase, which is the main editor window. As you can see in the lower window, we have five separate tabs. One of them is completely dedicated to the sampler control. And today we're going to try to figure out what's different about it from the regular sample editor and how we can best use it in our workflow on a day-to-day -day basis. But first things first, let's not run before we can walk. I'm going to throw this away. And now we're back to a pair of audio tracks that I've dragged straight out of Media Bay. We have one loop, which is natively at 107 BPM, and I've set my project to that so that I don't have to mess around with musical mode. And before we go any further, I'll just give you a quick preview of what we're dealing with today. Okay, so here's the loop on its own. And then we have a chord stab which sounds like that. Okay, so we've got two nice, simple audio files. One of them is a simple chord stab, one of them's a loop, but they are what they are. If you want to do anything else with those audio files, in terms of, let's say, turning this chord stab into something that can be played over multiple keys, at the moment it's locked into just that note, it's an E minor. You're going to need to load it into Hallion, do some key mapping, maybe some envelope processing, and get this thing in a state where it's fit to be used on the keyboard. That's pretty much the entire use case for the sampler control. It's all about taking an audio file and wrapping it in a really convenient MIDI wrapper that allows us to interact with it via our keyboard. To start with today, I'm gonna to use the chord stab. I'm gonna create a sampler control track associated with that. And here's how we do it in the lower window, if you have your sampler control open, it's telling you exactly what you need to do. Pick up your audio file, drop it onto your empty sampler control. Now a couple of things happen. A new track appears in the project window, which is empty. And in the lower window, we have a sample view, which is suspiciously similar to the sample editor, but it's not the same. This is effectively a read-only view of that sample. We are gonna be able to do editing on it, and probably the best way for you to think about the sampler control is that it's a lightweight, non-destructive sample player. With my sample track selected, I'm gonna press an E3 on the keyboard, and there's my audio, but it's now being implicitly mapped. You can actually see in the little virtual piano roll down at the bottom what I'm doing. Once I let go of the key, there's a very little tail to the sample, it's not stopping playing immediately. So there's clearly more to this sample player than meets the eye. We're getting some stuff for free. We're basically getting a usable sample laden keyboard right out of the box. Before we go on to talk about the editor, let's have a look at the project window and try to figure out what this track's doing because the track is empty and it doesn't seem to have any relation to anything else. What's, what is this track? Well, in effect, it's a MIDI track that's been implicitly tied to a sample behind the scenes. We have a button here called open or close sampler, which is literally just doing that. And it's basically kind of hiding the underlying sample when I turn that off. But other than that, it's effectively a MIDI track. To really drive that point home, I'm gonna get my pencil out and I'm gonna create a part on that track. And that part is a MIDI part. If I double click this part that I've just created, now it opens a MIDI editor. And if I draw some notes into this editor and play, it is in every significant respect a MIDI part. We can jump back over to the sampler control to see the currently highlighted sample. So just to drive that point home, let's create a second sampler control track so that we can toggle between them. This time I'm gonna use the loop track, but rather than dragging it down um, onto the drop audio sample message, I'll do it via a slightly different means to show you an alternative way to work. I'm gonna head up to add track. This time I'm gonna add a sampler track. I'm not gonna give it a name, I'll just leave all of my defaults blank. Say add track. So what we have here is an empty sampler track. It hasn't yet been assigned an audio file, so it doesn't know what to do. 
This is why, as a matter of interest, it's much easier to drag your audio down onto this little message because it's doing those two jobs in one. What I now need to do is manually add this audio into the sampler track and I can do it by simply clicking on the audio and completing the job that I could have done in one step. I'll take a quick look in the window down below and I'm going to see that my root key is C3. So that's going to be the note uh, that's been assigned to the default loop. Let's play a C3. And there's the loop. Now that we've got two sampler tracks, it's possible to AB between them. And we can see that each time we select the track, doesn't matter what I do in the project viewer, simply by selecting the track, I'm selecting the underlying audio that's associated with that track. Whether I have MIDI note information stored in a MIDI part is irrelevant. That's an additional layer that's going to go on top and be useful when I'm songwriting, but it's not important to actually hear the thing. Before we go on to have a look at the functionality of the sampler control, just take a moment to think about what's going on from the project perspective. I'm going to open the audio pool. And if you take a look at the audio folder in the background, you can see that we only have two audio files. So sampler tracks are effectively metadata tracks. They're not actually doing anything real until you tell them to do something real. If you actually want to turn all of this audio into real audio, let's say you want to take this project um, to a different computer and you need access to the actual audio, you can simply right click on the audio folder and say prepare archive. That will basically create physical copies of each of these audio tracks in your audio pool and it then will be safe to, uh, to export. So the sampler tracks are references to the underlying audio, but they allow us to perform a whole host of editing operations on them. You've already seen me create MIDI notes to represent um, Cs and Bs for this E minor chord. So now let's see what else we can do. I can actually mute the original audio. Everything that we're gonna hear from this point onwards will be using the sampler control audio. So if I press play now, We'll still, we'll still hear those notes. They're being played from the MIDI track that's then in turn referencing the audio file. In the toolbar across the top of the sampler control, we have some basic information. Most of these functions speak for themselves. For instance, if I set the root key up a note, now when I press F3 on the keyboard, I'm gonna get the basic sound. Here we can set some basic loop mode parameters. So if I set up this sample to play in continuous mode and just hold an E down on the keyboard. Now you can see where the sample end is and eventually it's going to loop around. But I can actually edit this sample as much as I want. So I'm just zooming in so that I can see a little bit more of it now. And then I can pick up the sustain loop end, drag that in. And now I've just set a different sustain loop point. A little cycle around. So it's basically just like you're operating inside a mini little sample editor where you get kind of edited highlights, the most convenient things that you most likely want to do with a sample. Turn it into one shot and now a small hit on the key. I'm not pressing the key down anymore. It's in one shot mode so it will play right to the end of the sample. We can normalize the sample, we can reverse it, we can set it to play monophonically. Really handy set of basic functions. Down at the bottom of the window, we get some, again, fairly basic. These are the most common operations that you're going to want to perform. Editors for various different parameters about the sample. So for instance, I'll just set this back to no loop. Remember earlier when I was saying there was a little bit of tail on the envelope? Well, that's gonna be inside the amplifier. So if we open the modifier for the amplifier, now you get to see where that release tail is. So if I press a note and then release it fairly quickly, you see there's a fairly brief release on it. If I make that release longer, there it is. And in fact, from this point onwards, we can interact in a fairly rich way with the um, amplitude envelope. If I double click in this little window, I can create nodes that give me a more complex amplitude envelope. I can pick up these nodes and make them more intense. Select a range of those nodes and delete to get rid of them. Let's add some tremolo. By default, the amplifier modulator is assigned to one of two sampler controlled low frequency oscillators. So LFO2 is essentially pre-assigned to the amplifier. 
On the right hand side of the screen, you can see LFOs one and two. These two controls are my volume controls. And if I hover over the one labeled LFO, you can see it says volume LFO modulation depth. Well, LFO modulation depth, as far as amplitude is concerned, basically means tremolo. So if I turn this control up, now we have varying volume. If I make that LFO much faster, it's about five hertz, there's my tremolo. And I can do the same thing for pan. Let's have some pan. And then I can control click those controls to set them back to zero. LFO one is assigned into the pitch modulator. So let's have a look at that, see what's going on. Okay, that's pretty intense. Let's turn that down a bit. So the depth is gonna determine how radical that pitch variance is. Speed it up a lot. And make it much more gentle. And I've got vibrato. Let's control click on the pitch LFO mod to turn that off again. Let's engage the filter module. It's currently off by default. Turn it on. The modulator button now highlights, showing us that we can enter the filter modulation settings. And now if I play a note, there's me playing with the filter cutoff of the overall tone. So I've basically got a filter control for the sample now. But much more than just having the controls down here where we set the cutoff and the, res um, the resonance, we actually have a dedicated filter envelope as well. So where we were previously looking at the amplitude envelope, now this brown envelope is the filter envelope. What this means is that I can generate a dynamic filter sweep every time I press a key. Now by default, the filter envelope is not engaged. Have a look at the left hand side of the envelope. Can you see we have an amount control here and it's defaulting to 0%. Jump back to the amplitude modulator very briefly. We don't have that. So the amplitude modulator is engaged all the time. You've always got control over your volume. But when you engage the filter modulator, you need to dial in some filter amount. So I'm gonna do that now. Click this little filter envelope amount control and turn it up to 70%. That's good enough. Now I have a filter envelope that's going to apply a sweep or basically whatever envelope shape I draw to the filter every time I press a key. So if I pull my cutoff way down, this is basically the resting point of the envelope once it's finished its and decay phase, it's going, to, it's going to decay down to this sustain point. And by setting a very low cutoff, let's give myself some resonance as well. Introduce a little bit of key follow to make brighter notes have a more dramatic cutoff effect. And then I'm just going to extend the amplitude envelope a little bit more to give me more release because I'm pressing these notes quite quickly. Now there's a possible branch point here. I might be perfectly happy with that sound. I've got all of that stuff really conveniently right there in the Cubase editor. And that's absolutely fine. That's what the sampler control is all about. But let's say you wanna do more editing on that sound. You think to yourself, okay, the sampler control has given me a good starting point, but now I want the full power of Hallion to start editing this sound properly. Well, you've basically got a one button conversion process for that. Go up to your toolbar in the sampler control. You can say transfer to new instrument. Click this button. You can see all the different plugins to which you can assign these audio settings. So if I say transfer to Hallion, everything that I just did in the sampler control has now been converted into a Hallion preset. Here's my sample. If we have a look in the filter section, there's my cutoff frequency, 148 Hertz. Do we have any envelopes? Yes, we do. 
there's my long amplitude envelope. So basically everything has been converted into a fully fledged Halion preset. From this point onwards, the sampler control is effectively redundant and you're saying, I'm going to do much more work than you're capable of. Leave it to me from this point. So really the sampler control is all about what do you want to do with this sound? It's great for getting you up and running because you've got so much flexibility very quickly. But if you ever get to the stage where you're thinking, I'm a little bit limited in my choices now, no, you're not. You're literally one click away from the full power of Halion or Groove Agent if you were dealing with a rhythm. I've just cleaned up the project a little bit, got rid of that Halion instance. Now we're gonna have a look at this loop that's been here since the beginning. Because this is a rhythm, this is a perfect opportunity to demonstrate the slice feature. So with the sampler track selected, I'm gonna click on the slicing button and then turn it on. And I have a threshold control, which as I turn up and down, you can see these little white lines appear. That's basically how many slices this rhythm is gonna be chopped up into. I can see some here, this first slice for instance, isn't really a division worth um, paying any attention to. So I'm just gonna get something that visually looks fairly reasonable. And from this point, what's basically happened is that instead of the notes of the keyboard being mapped chromatically, they've now been mapped to different sections of this rhythm. So if I press a C3, you just get that first zone and each ascending note, C sharp, plays a different section of that rhythm. I can then pick up the entire MIDI pattern, drag it up onto the corresponding sampler track, and I can now mute the original audio. We don't need to hear that anymore. Now, when I play back this MIDI part, which is literally just a series of ascending notes, it's gonna play that rhythm back in sliced sections. Now I'm just gonna do some very simple rearranging of some notes that have similar lengths. So I'll pick the D sharp three up to G three, and I'm just gonna move them to different notes in the same area. And now we've got a new rhythm. At this point, I could then send that rhythm into Groove Agent for further processing. Transfer to new instrument. This time I'm going to select Groove Agent. And over on the instrument tab, it's assigned each one of those rhythms to an instrument pad. with which I can then construct a rhythm from there. So in summary, the sampler control sits right between the single raw audio file with which you can do very little, the fully featured, extremely powerful engines such as Halion and Groove Agent that allow you to do basically anything you want, but let's face it, there's a significant overhead. It sits right in between those two extremes. You can do a lot of really cool stuff very quickly with the sampler control. And if you ever find that you're constrained by the environment, it's a matter of moments to send it into one of the fully fledged instruments to carry on from there. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please hit like if you did. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and check out the Patreon and channel member links uh, below if you'd like to help support me. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.